Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. Two Worlds 2 is an open world action RPG released in 2010 by Reality Pump. Ready to do a little work. Even though the first game in this franchise became a huge meme, it managed to sell more than 2 million copies. For such a small studio like Reality Pump, this was a massive success and the sequel was bound to happen. But after what happened with the first game, we can't exactly say that a lot of people were excited for the sequel, and rightfully so. <laughs> it's a funny story to say the least. Two Worlds was one of those games that we can describe as so bad that it's good, in a way. It had horrible but very funny voice acting and sound effects. They asked for you, people. Tell me more. Swiftly now. Extremely rough animations and janky gameplay, but underneath all of that there was some fun to be had. The sequel had a lot of similar ideas, but this time around the production value of the game was obviously a lot higher. Two Worlds 2 had a budget of a proper AA RPG and you can immediately tell the difference in quality when it comes to some major features like the voice acting and the presentation. However, even though the bigger budget is more than welcome, it doesn't necessarily mean the sequel is going to be more fun to play because of this. The reception of the sequel was interesting to say the least. The review scores from the critics were much better than the first game, but the average user score is noticeably lower. It's a similar story when it comes to Steam reviews as well. The first game has much better reviews on Steam, so take that as you will. In my personal opinion, I think the sequel is a lot better game in general, but it still suffered from more than a couple of problems that we're going to address in this video. I have no idea what you just said to me. Before we even begin to analyze every major aspect of the game, I have to say that my biggest problem with Two Worlds 2 is not exactly the game itself. Reality Pump, the studio behind this game, is a former shadow of itself ever since they were acquired by their publisher, Topware Interactive. A couple of key people left the studio and joined CD Projekt Red, and that's when it all went downhill for Reality Pump. Topper Interactive is just a terrible, consumer-unfriendly company that has the tendency to lie to its customers. Long after the game released, they implemented Marketplace, which is an in-game store where you can buy pointless microtransactions. The game had some serious problems with the DRM, and even today you'll have some of these issues if you buy Two Worlds 2 on Steam. But that's not even the worst part about this lovely company. They kept making new expansions for the game, which doesn't sound bad at all, until you actually try them out. Let's just put it this way, the base game had its fair share of problems that we're going to discuss, but there is a huge disparity of quality between the base game and all the DLCs. This video is focused around the base game experience, but we're going to talk about the DLCs as well. Anyway, let's leave the DLC discussion for later and start talking about the base game. Shut the fuck up. I'm in charge here and I'm the talking person, understood? The setting and the story of Two Worlds 2 takes place only five years after the happenings of the first game. The nameless protagonist and his sister Kira have been captured in Gandohar's castle. Gandohar is the emperor of Antalor and he's the main antagonist of the game. Your sister Kira is a vessel of a very powerful demon called Aziral and Gandohar has been using her as a power source. But in order to keep her alive, he also needs the hero to transfer the magic between the two. In the meantime, a group of orcs have a mission to rescue the hero from a castle because they have a plan to stop Gandohar once and for all. A female orc called Darfa kills the guards and shows you the way out of the castle. This is where it all begins and just like in the first game, you take the role of a nameless hero that you get to fully customize within a decent character customization system. The game has a very lengthy tutorial section, it's about 40 to 50 minutes long, depending on how you play of course. Now, I usually have a problem with long tutorial sections in open world games, but Two Worlds 2 does a really good job with this. For the most part, it doesn't feel forced because it's almost seamlessly integrated in the main story. But still, it takes quite a while for the game to completely open up. After you successfully escape the castle, you end up on a small island, which is basically like an extended tutorial section. This place is like your hub area I guess, even though there are no specific reasons to hang around here. Right off the bat, you get to meet some important characters that you're going to visit every now and then when you progress through the main story. If you played the first game, you'll probably think it's a bit weird how you got rescued by a bunch of orcs because humans and orcs pretty much hate each other. The intro cutscene is about a huge battle between Gandohar's army and the orcs, where orcs suffered some heavy casualties. This battle almost wiped them out completely actually. The intro cutscene was pretty cool by the way. 
However, the orcs are not working alone and shortly after the prison section, you get to meet the leader of this group. The prophet Kasara is a really important character in the main story and she tells you a lot more about Gandohar's newly acquired power. She also shows you a terrible vision of what could potentially happen if Gandohar is not stopped. I think Kasara has a very cool and unique visual design, although the volume of her voice is much louder compared to other NPCs. This is a common problem in this game and it can be really annoying, especially if you're playing with headphones, but let's leave this for the sound and music discussion. I think the main story was pretty interesting and it's not hard to follow. It comes off really generic in the beginning, but it actually has some interesting plot twists and solid writing through the campaign. The majority of major characters you're going to meet are well written and memorable. A huge part of the main quest is about Gandohar himself. You need to learn as much as possible about his past and how exactly he became the Emperor, which is supposed to help you understand how to stop him and save Kira from his deadly grasp. But in order to do that, you have to meet various people from Antalor, and as you might expect, they won't offer to help you out of the kindness of their hearts. So you quickly get involved in local political affairs in pretty much every major place you get to visit. Come to think of it, this is something that I extensively criticized in my previous review video, which was about Arcania. Arcania basically had the same design philosophy when it comes to the main story. You get very little context for what you need to do and then you run around the map doing various and for the most part unrelated quests for local people, until you finally get some more info about the main plot of the game, rinse and repeat. The main quest in Two Worlds 2 is very similar to this, but later chapters in the game are much more focused on the plot itself. The thing is, there is nothing fundamentally wrong with designing the story like this, unless the writing is really bad, like in Arcania. You want to marry me? Don't you? Sure, it... it just comes so quickly, comes so quickly. She's pregnant, she won't say no. What? Comes so quickly. In fact, the majority of critical acclaimed RPGs have the same story structure. The Emperor is not known for his patience. He wants his daughter back safe and sound, as soon as possible. Yeah... Mention something of the sort. Where the hell do you go? Most of the quests you get to do in Two Worlds 2 are pretty interesting because people you meet have believable issues and agendas. Although the world itself is not very convincing or immersive, at least when it comes to populated places full of NPCs. The open areas are pretty decent and fun to explore actually. Same goes for indoor areas and dungeons, which to my surprise are quite varied and fun to explore. There is not a lot of copy and pasting when it comes to these dungeons, which is something that a lot of RPGs do, but on the other side, you won't find a ton of dungeons on the map. Towns and cities you get to visit just fail to create a decent illusion of living and breathing worlds, even though some NPCs will do a bit more than just walk around. Speaking about that, the game has a very annoying crime system. If you just bump into people, which will happen quite often, this bar will start filling up and you'll get attacked by the guards. But if you try and open a chest in someone's house, they will just give you a death stare without saying or doing anything. It's like they're silently judging you or something, it's really weird. Everything around these populated places feels really fake, for the lack of a better word. Walking through this place feels like you're playing Assassin's Creed 1, which ironically had a similar problem, but it's a totally different game. Anyway, the game offers you some flexibility when it comes to solving quests, in terms of a couple of decisions you get to make. They usually have at least a couple of different options you can pick in dialogue, which will cause different outcomes. Even though the writing is pretty solid and I had a lot of fun with most of the quests you get to do, I honestly didn't care that much about the choices you get. I think the game has to have at least a couple of more features to properly support the system of choices and consequences. There is no morality, reputation or karma system of any kind, which would incentivize the player to pay more attention to these choices. I'm very, very sorry, sir. Does that make you feel better? The hero doesn't have any character development throughout the main story. The main story is linear as it gets, but the quests which are indirectly related to the main story are not. That's where those choices you get to make come into play. You'll usually get to decide the fate of some important and common people you get to meet in the world. It's a missed opportunity to try and shape the personality of this nameless hero and maybe even affect the outcome of the main story. That's possibly too much to ask for, but I think the game was already halfway there with these features. There are a decent amount of important choices you get to make while solving these quests, and it feels like a missed opportunity to create a comprehensive RPG system around this. So even though I always appreciate this feature, it feels underdeveloped. 
Speaking of underdeveloped features, 2 Worlds 2 has a couple of different guilds and you can do some quests for them. When you first learned of this, you could get really excited to join these guilds, which is logical. But in reality, none of them feel like proper factions and they only have a handful of quests for you to solve. It never feels like you're actually joining a guild, even though you can tell that Reality Pump really wanted to create something like that. You can get some minor benefits, like the price reduction from merchants when you get a higher reputation with the merchants guilds. The arena was really fun though, and it has some strong Oblivion vibes. What am I up against? A dwarf. A dwarf? You deaf? Been a long time since we've had one in the arena. Not a problem. He might appear slow with that huge axe in his hands, but make no mistake, he knows how to use it. It's funny because the first game was promoted as Oblivion Killer. Yeah, anyway, the main quest will lead you through a couple of different open world zones. Each chapter has a different zone and a brand new major quest you have to solve. Like I said before, the purpose of this quest is to learn more about Gandohar's past. Once you get enough info, you go back to the Prophet and report your findings so you can get further instructions. Chapter 1 and 2 will give you just a fraction of the main story, but these two chapters feel the longest. Especially if you decide to explore everything and do every quest which the game offers. I think the game does a great job with this because each new zone is quite different, which keeps the exploration fresh. We'll talk more about the exploration and the zones in the gameplay section. When you get to chapter 3, the main story really kicks off because you start learning a lot more about Gandohar's past. You'll meet some really interesting characters in this chapter which are related to Gandohar's past, but they also have a very interesting story of their own that you'll get to experience in this chapter. When you get up to this point, you should notice that nothing is as it seems in this game. Almost every quest has some twists and turns, and it's what keeps the story of the game interesting if you ask me. Even the side quests are pretty decent. For example, in chapter 2 you can do a quest for this lady that sells umbrellas. The only problem is, the umbrellas have been eating her customers. Yeah, some quests are definitely goofy, but interesting nonetheless. Chance of death, mediocre pay, helpless ingrates, hm. count me in. When chapter 3 ends, you're pretty much going to know almost everything about Gandohar's past. Chapter 4 is the last and the shortest chapter in the game. You have to go back to Gandohar's castle where we started the game and hopefully stop him once and for all and save your sister Kira. But as you might expect, it's not really that straightforward, there are some plot twists along the way. To sum up my spoiler free thoughts about the story, I think it offers a really solid experience. Although some parts of the story felt a bit disappointing, like some one dimensional characters and you can easily find a couple of plot holes here and there. For example, the orcs you meet in the beginning are really disappointing because it all implied they were supposed to be important characters. But they come across as very one dimensional characters who only had a purpose in the very beginning. It's a shame because all of them had the potential to be very memorable characters. Darfa is probably the most disappointing character in the entire game when it comes to this. Tell me, you ever stop talking? But that doesn't mean the game has no memorable characters at all. Even though it's been very long since I last completed the main story campaign, I had no problems remembering what happened in this chapter. Chapter 1 and 2 also have some pretty good characters. My biggest gripe with the main story is definitely the ending and there is no way I can talk about it without spoiling the entire game. To put it simply, in the end, the story just feels really rushed. So this would be a good time to start talking about the spoilers. I'll have a separate timestamp so you can easily skip this if you plan to play the game for the first time. You still there? Good. Well, it turns out that Gandohar is not so bad after all, because when you finally get to meet him again, he actually helps you? Why? Well, apparently, he was controlled by Aziral, the demon that possessed your sister Kira. Before you managed to escape, he was using your life force to sustain Kira as Aziral's vessel. He needs to keep Kira alive at all costs. The main goal of this demon was to consume the entire world so he can rebuild it in his image. The Fire God is hungry, hates the diversity of our world. Really? So Azirol would instantly get cancelled on social media, I guess. <laughs> no, but seriously, he wants to destroy all humans and orcs and pretty much everything else except one specific species, the dragons. Throughout the whole game, you're led to believe that dragons have been extinct, but that's only partially true. Here comes the biggest plot twist, so hold on to your nutsack. The Prophet Kassara was behind all of this because she herself is a dragon and she wanted to finally free Aziral. 
Since Gandohar was a big obstacle, she came up with a plan to separate you from your sister, so Gandohar would have to use his own life force to keep Kira alive, which would eventually make him a lot weaker. Kira has to die in order to Azeral to be released, by the way, so keep that in mind. Let me just put it this way. If you don't try to think about what happens here, the plot twist is pretty cool and unexpected. However, if you even try to use 1% of your brain cells, you're going to find a ton of plot holes and nothing makes sense here. I mean, sure, shock value is definitely strong when you learn about the true nature of Kasara. Kira tells you that Azirwal was controlling Gandohar from the very beginning. If that was actually true, Azirwal could easily kill Gandohar or force him to kill himself at the very least, right? I mean, if Gandohar was the only thing which is stopping him, it would be a logical thing to do. Or how about forcing Gandohar to kill Kira so he can release himself? Hello? <laughs> it's a funny story to say the least. But let's assume that Gandohar was not completely controlled by Azeral, even though Kira said the opposite. Remember how I said in the beginning that you were imprisoned here for 5 years? So you want to tell me that even after 5 years you somehow didn't know anything about any of this? I mean, Kira obviously knew about everything and Gandohar was only trying to protect her. Even though in the beginning cutscene he slaps her around and he's acting like a stereotypical evil bad guy. But at the very end, he turns into a very good guy who is worried about the people in the kingdom and your safety. I mean, sure, whatever, dude. Gandohar always seemed like over-the-top evil guy who wants power, and even all the flashback sequences from the main story were depicting him like that. I can go on and on about the inconsistencies of this ending, but I don't want to do that. When I said before that writing is pretty decent, this is definitely not what I had in mind. The ending just seems rushed and incomplete. I was a good guy all along is a very cheap plot twist and I hate when games try to pull this off. Kasara's plot twist is a lot better, but I'm not a huge fan when the game lies to you from the very beginning, without giving you the chance to figure out that something is wrong. This would be easily fixable with at least a couple of different endings, I mean, it's an RPG after all. One of those endings could be a way to figure out that you're being a stupid idiot for this entire time. But the main story is completely linear in Two Worlds 2, you're just in for the ride. I would be ready to forgive that if the ending was done at least a little bit better. Speaking about the ending, when you kill Kassara, you get all the ingredients to trap Azeral in his sarcophagus. All of those ingredients are part of his creations, demons, orcs. Wait a minute, orcs? If Azeral created orcs, why would he want to completely wipe them out? And all her children were burned. <laughs> Nothing would stop him this time. Not all her children. Elves, dwarves, orcs, and even man, orcs. Anyway, the game ends and Kira becomes a new Gandohar because there always need to be a Lich King, game over. The hero doesn't want to be the new emperor because it would be very boring to sit around all day. All of a sudden Darfa disappears along with all the orcs. Yeah, not a huge fan of this ending. Hmm. Darfa? Well, that was a pretty big spoiler discussion, even though I tried to keep it as short as possible. I mean, yeah, the ending doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and maybe I missed something, I don't know. However, this didn't ruin my experience with the game, I had a lot of fun. Which finally brings us to the gameplay. <laughs> That's rich. Like I said before, the game has an extensive tutorial section where you get to learn some important things about the gameplay, especially the combat. First of all, let's talk about the controls. This is hands down the biggest issue that most people might have with the gameplay. Even though the controls are pretty responsive in general, controlling your character feels extremely floaty. The game just fails to create a proper sense of weight behind the actions your character executes. So the combat might be awful because of this, right? Well, kinda, but not really. The introduction to melee combat in the dungeon feels pretty bad, for the reasons I mentioned above. But the melee combat is far from being broken or unusable, it works really well when you try to learn how the mechanics work. Combined with a good progression system and very good balancing, believe it or not, it can turn out to be really enjoyable for the most part. I also decided to play the game on the hard difficulty and I beat the whole game like this, so my experience is completely based around this difficulty. My character was basically a battle mage, I used a couple of different spells and the majority of melee abilities as well. The game also has equally useful range skills if you decide to go with a bow. What came as a big surprise to me is the assassin gameplay and skills, which is definitely a very viable playstyle. There's sneaking, backstabbing and a ton of useful traps you can use. 
However, all of that pales in comparison with the extensive magic system which the game offers, but I'm not done talking about the melee gameplay yet. It takes some time until the melee combat becomes comprehensible. Blocking is paramount in this game and it's the first thing you should keep in mind if you decide to use melee skills. I used two-handed weapons for the most part, so I had to invest some points to make blocking more effective in order to take less damage. I believe shields are way more effective even from the start, but don't quote me on that because I didn't use them at all. Anyway, you have 12 different melee abilities that you can unlock and some of them are restricted to certain weapon types. For example, you can use a very useful AoE spinning attack with a two-handed sword which damages all enemies around you. Or if you decide to go with a two-handed axe or pole arms, you can attempt to stun the enemy with a different ability. My favorite ability with the two-handed sword was the execute move that you can use when the enemy is knocked down. It's basically an instant kill every time, but it only works on smaller enemies. Speaking about the knockdown, there is a kick ability which can help you with that and it's usable when you're blocking, which is extremely useful. Yeah. However, the chance for success is based on percentage that you can increase when you dump more points into this ability. Your regular attack can turn into a special attack which can knock down the enemy or cause heavy damage. This can feel a bit awkward and you can even put yourself in a disadvantage when some of these RNG abilities trigger. Regular attacks are quite fast and when these special abilities trigger, the attack animation is a lot longer which leaves you open for attacks. I'm not a huge fan of RNG abilities in games with action combat systems. I don't mind the kick ability which has the chance to fail, but when I press the basic attack button I like to have consistency so I know what to expect. There is only a certain amount of randomness which proper action combat systems can afford to have, otherwise the combat can feel really, well, random. You can make an argument that RNG is supposed to mimic the dice roll which is one of the features that have deep roots in the RPG genre. This works fine for turn-based RPGs, but it doesn't blend so well with action combat systems. The most common RNG mechanic in RPGs with action combat systems would probably be the critical chance. There are probably a couple of more RNG features that can work well, but it's kind of hard to pull off anything else which is based around RNG. I think the whole point of action combat systems in RPGs is finding a good balance between skills that require muscle memory and the progression system. Come to think of it, before you can actually invest points and use the skills in this game, you have to find the skill books. You can buy them off at various merchants, which is also pretty random, but you'll find these books just by exploring the world. It's not a huge problem because you're probably going to find the majority of skills you want to use, but still, I'm not a huge fan of this. I believe I had the same criticism in my Assassin's Creed Valhalla review. Learning new abilities just felt extremely random in that game. But anyway, I was pleasantly surprised with the AI in combat. You're going to fight multiple enemies almost all the time and they will usually try to surround you, which can actually make the fight a lot harder. Ranged enemies will try to keep out of the melee range and NPCs even start running if their health is low. You have to face the enemy in order to block so you can take some heavy damage from the sides and the back. The only thing which makes this more frustrating than it should be is the targeting system. The game has a soft lock-on system which is not really responsive. Switching targets in melee range can be really clumsy and I died a lot because of this. The gameplay is quite fast so you don't have a ton of time to react which would be fine if the targeting was done better. The game doesn't play around on the hard difficulty, you can die in just a couple of hits especially if you don't invest some points into health. With each level you gain you get some stat points to invest. No matter what kind of a playstyle you're going for, if you don't increase your health pool you're going to have a tough time in combat especially on the hard difficulty. There is another extremely useful combat mechanic if you decide to play with melee weapons. The parry is very powerful move and it doesn't require an extremely precise timing from the player. As long as you hold the block button when you get hit, you have a huge window for pressing the attack button which will make the hero perform a couple of hits in a row. This attack has a huge AoE effect and you will hit everything around you for some heavy damage. It's really good and even a little bit OP sometimes. But like I said, the game can easily kick your ass if you let your guard down. It was very common for me to enter the fight and kill a bunch of NPCs with few parries and other abilities, but I also got killed a bunch of times by the same enemies in some situations. I mentioned that the game is surprisingly well balanced before and for a good reason. If you wanna maximize the damage you deal, you just have to pay attention to enemies resistances. 
you can see these icons on all enemies with some weird exceptions and they pretty much show what type of damage you should not use. For example, you have two different types of melee damage, blunt and slash I guess, I don't know the official names because I don't believe it's ever mentioned. If the enemy is resistant to blunt damage, all of your blunt weapons will have a very noticeable penalty on the damage outputs. It's always a good idea to switch the weapon in those situations because even a much weaker weapon with a different damage type will do more damage. I think this is another example how good is the balancing in this game. To make things clear, this is not only related to melee weapons. You'll have to pay attention to resistances in general, especially as a mage, because magic has more than a couple of different damage types. What makes switching your weapons and abilities very easy in this game is three different profiles that you can switch on the fly with the press of a button. My first profile was for heavy armor with slashing damage, the second was for all of my spells and mage equipment and the third was reserved for blunt melee damage. You will have a lot better experience in combat if you set up your profiles for different damage types and use them accordingly. Two Worlds 2 also managed to find a great balance between crafting and buying new weapons. It's pretty easy to increase the strength of the weapon and the materials can be acquired by scrapping the items you don't need. Every now and then you'll be able to find stronger weapons at merchants and replace even your fully upgraded weapon. However, it takes a while for that to happen so it doesn't feel pointless to upgrade your weapon. And you get to scrap the weapon you were using so you can increase the strength of your new weapon and it's a pretty good gameplay loop. Weapons and armors have gem slots as well and you can considerably increase the power of an item with high level gems. To make the customization even more enjoyable, the game allows you to buy different dice, which you can apply on armor pieces. Now let's talk a little bit about the magic system. Tell me, you ever stop talking? I mentioned this magic system in more than a couple of my videos and for a good reason. It allows you to be very creative with your spells and it's definitely the best way to experience the gameplay. First of all, you need the amulet and a bunch of magic cards to make a spell. The effect and carrier card is like the base for the spell you want to make and then you start adding different modifiers. You can make some regular basic spells like fire projectiles, traps, summoning different monsters, healing, etc etc. But you can also make some crazy combinations when you invest some more points into magic related skills. I will now play a couple of short clips from my older videos about this magic system so you can see how crazy it can get. <laughs> Looks fun, right? The game really encourages you to experiment with modifiers as long as you have all the cards. My character wasn't that crazy with the spells because I focused on the melee skills as well. If my memory serves me well, the first time I played this game back in 2010, my character had a mix of melee and range skills and I had a lot of fun with the bow. The tutorial does a great job at showcasing a really fun range skill that you can use. Firing a couple of arrows at once at multiple enemies. And while this is really cool, it's one of those skills that totally lack the sense of impact. I haven't played with other ranged skills on this playthrough, so I can't really talk about that. But you can totally choose to play as a pure ranged character and have enough skills and gadgets. Like I said before, I was pleasantly surprised with all the assassin skills in this game. On the other side, the game can be a bit too convenient when it comes to enemy placement. As you explore the world, you find a lot of enemies with their back turned, even when it doesn't make a lot of sense. This was obviously a way to incentivize the assassin playstyle because you can perform instant stealth kills from the back. When it comes to boss fights, the game is kinda disappointing, especially the end boss. You won't find a ton of boss fights in the game anyway, but even when you do, they don't require much strategy or skill. In fact, you'll have a much tougher time with a couple of stronger regular enemies than actual bosses. Although the game was obviously not trying to focus on the boss fights, so it's not a huge deal if you ask me. Two Worlds 2 has plenty of different enemy types, although I think most of them feel pretty similar in combat. I briefly mentioned exploration, so let's talk a little bit about this topic. 
Toy Worlds 2 has a couple of very different zones that you can explore as you progress through the main story. First you get the desert, which is the biggest zone in the game. You can get a horse very early in the game and explore this zone with a mount. There are also some horse races in which you can participate. I didn't bother with using a horse at all, except for one race in the beginning. Not because the riding mechanics are bad, they are actually pretty decent. The only thing which is a bit annoying is the gallop button that you need to tap and not hold. Other than that, the handling of the horse is pretty damn good. For example, it's way better than Skyrim's horse mechanics and that game came out one year after Two Worlds 2. Anyway, the zone in the second chapter is heavily influenced by Asian culture and it's a great switch of atmosphere. The wood in this area feels very different, with lush vegetation and a couple of interesting places to explore. It's a lot smaller zone compared to the desert though. The city of this place is my favorite populated location in the entire game. The third chapter is set in a swamp, which is a lot bigger place and once again the atmosphere in this place is quite different. You'll fight a lot of zombies here and you won't be able to leave until you complete the main quest. Chapter 4 is set in a place called the Swallows, which is like a wasteland. This place used to be the original university from chapter 2 until Gandorhar's failed experiment destroyed it. Once again, this place has a very different vibe compared to everything else. It's a lot darker and you're going to fight very strong creatures around here. Exploring everything that these zones have to offer can be quite rewarding as well, especially if you choose to invest some points into lockpicking. The lockpicking minigame is quite interesting if you ask me. You can find a ton of chests left and right and locks have different level of skills required. The loot seems to be almost completely randomized in the game, but there are definitely loot tables which keep the loot close to your level. It's not exactly like Skyrim's level lists, but it's something similar to that. Weapons and armor will require you to have certain amount of skill points invested within a certain category. There are heavy and light armor and you can't mix the armor pieces from these two categories. For example, some capes can only be equipped with heavy or light armor and some armor doesn't allow you to equip a bow. It's a bit weird, but I don't mind this at all because switching between different weapon sets is very seamless like we mentioned before. Oh yeah, the game also has capes with physic effects. The physic effect can also be seen within a couple of different spells like the one I showed before. When you explore the map you can find some very tough enemies which are obviously a lot higher level than you and the only choice you have is to come back later when you're stronger. If you watch my videos about RPGs, you know I prefer fixed level enemies and zones instead of level scaling so this is right up my alley. For example I found this cave with very strong skeletons near the beginning of the game and I got completely owned. Every time you get a bit stronger it's very noticeable in fights and the whole progression system is done really well. I hit a brick wall a couple of times in terms of the damage I'm being able to inflict on enemies. When that happens, I start visiting every merchant in major cities in order to find a stronger weapon. Or at least I buy some common weapons that I can scrap and increase the strength of my current weapon. Some bosses you'll fight will drop a very good weapon that you can use for a long time, especially if you upgrade them. There are some small attention to detail when it comes to the gameplay, which are worth mentioning. For example, when you run uphill, your movement speed is noticeably lower, no matter which armor type you're using. You can find items which will increase your movement speed on foot, even though you can get a horse. I would say that RPG mechanics in this game are pretty damn good overall. The user interface in the game is amazing for a couple of reasons. First of all, it works great with mouse and keyboard and it's equally good with a controller. The interface is clean and more importantly very functional. It's very easy to see all the important info about all items and their properties, especially when it comes to weapons and armor. Skills and abilities have a very nice design, which is easy to understand. The only problem I had with the UI is the high transparency. It can be hard to see properly sometimes because of the high transparency with the background, so you have to move the camera. Up to this point you should probably have a good idea how the game looks. Two Worlds 2 came out in 2010 and it was never an amazing looking game, but it was good enough. The desert area is definitely fun to explore, but visually it's really bland and boring. It was probably not the best idea to start the game in this zone. Making a good looking desert area can be quite challenging, but to be honest, there are plenty of other games that did it a lot better than Two Worlds 2. When it comes to other areas, I already mentioned how different they all feel and the visual design is obviously a huge reason for that. I think this is one of those games that managed to find a good balance between realistic and stylized art style. There is a full day and night cycle that certainly changes the mood of the game a bit. Although I prefer when nights are a bit darker than this, it's pretty damn bright. The dungeons have a good amount of darkness though. 
When it comes to textures, I failed to notice any low-res assets in the open world, or just in general really. I was playing the game on 4K resolution on high details and I had almost locked 60 FPS all the time. You can see my PC specs on the screen, it's a pretty average PC for this day and age. Although I had to turn off anti-aliasing because I had huge FPS drops when I move for some reason. To be honest, I didn't notice a major difference in how the game looks, but I'm very easy to please when it comes to visuals in general. Speaking about turning things off, the blur makes the game look a lot worse in my opinion. It's really overdone and annoying, especially when you move. It's turned on by default, but I suggest turning it off. The thing is, you can't exactly get rid of it completely unless you take some extra steps outside of the game, but I was satisfied by just using the in-game settings. If you watch my recent reviews, you know I like to talk about character models in these older RPGs. Most of the games I recently covered had similar issues when it comes to character models. It was not uncommon to see identical faces on more than a couple of important characters, especially in AA RPGs. The quality of character models in this game is not outstanding by any means, but what came as a big surprise to me is the sheer variety of faces in the game which is arguably a lot more important than graphical fidelity. The vast majority of characters you're going to meet have unique faces. This was like a breath of fresh air after I almost had a nervous breakdown from meeting the same guy in Arcania over and over again. Armor and weapons in Two Worlds 2 look quite decent. For example, this Archmage Firestaff looks amazing. Although I was a bit disappointed with two-handed weapons, but this is really subjective. Most of these weapons have a very basic visual design, which is not bad by any means. I just think the game lacks some crazy looking fantasy style weapons. I don't mean over the top JRPG stuff, but something a bit crazier than this, if you know what I mean. The majority of enemies you're going to fight also have a great visual design. Even though I said that boss fights were disappointing, the way they look is great. The lighting in this game is serviceable, but not amazing by any means. And I don't remember seeing different weather effects, which is definitely disappointing. But yeah, to sum up the visuals, the game holds up okay for this day and age. I think the music in the game is actually amazing and has some very memorable tracks. I will play a couple of short samples from my favorite tracks in the game. The great music definitely makes the exploration way better in general. However, the sound effects could have been a lot better. I don't think they are bad, but they sound really basic and boring. The combat sound effects are another reason why everything feels weightless and devoid of any impact. The sound of clashing weapons in combat is a bit random, especially when you or the NPC is blocking. It can sound like there is a lot more happening on the screen than it actually is. Other sound effects in combat are mediocre at best. Some magic sound effects are quite decent actually. I briefly touched upon the voice acting in the beginning of the video and not for a good reason. First of all, the general quality of voice acting is quite decent. When you find yourself surrounded, rely on an area attack spell like Fire Blast. You'll definitely find some NPCs who sound like they're just reading the script in a very robotic way. But the majority of important NPCs have very decent voice actors. Falanon the Butcher has never exactly rolled off the tongue. However, the volume of the voices is really inconsistent. The voice actor of the main character always sounds like he's trying very hard not to wake up his wife or something. Pretty much every NPC in the game is way louder than him. Will we be able to help her? That remains to be uncertain. The problem with sound volume begins right after you talk with the Prophet. If you like to play with headphones, I think you're going to jump off your seat when you first initiate a dialogue with her. And she's not even the loudest NPC you're going to meet. This is probably the most unpolished feature in the game and it can be really annoying. I was increasing and decreasing the volume of my headphones almost constantly when I engage in a dialogue or a cutscene. 
Oh, and by the way, some cutscenes are unskippable, which is always a pain in the ass. But yeah, music very good, voice acting decent with a lot of volume problems, sound effects mediocre at best. So we finally get to talk about the infamous DLCs, oh boy. Let me just put it this way, if you play the base game and you really really like it, you can maybe consider buying the first DLC, but just maybe. I believe that Pirates of the Flying Fortress is one and only DLC which was developed by the original Reality Pump team, but don't quote me on that. It came out in 2011, so I'm pretty sure that's the case. You can play this DLC with your existing character with the ability to import the save or start with a brand new high level character. This DLC is about, well, pirates obviously, and the main quest takes you on a brand new adventure to find a lost treasure but also a lost woman. This DLC adds a couple of brand new islands on the map and you explore them with a boat. Yeah, the boat exploration is a brand new feature but it's pretty bad to be honest. The storytelling and especially the writing have a noticeable dip in quality and you'll be able to tell that right from the start. Got a name, Jack? How'd you know my name was Jack? Oh, wait. The voice actor for the hero is not the same, which is really off-putting, especially if you just spend 50 plus hours with the base game. The exploration is pretty fun though, and this DLC has some interesting fights. I would say that enemies in this DLC are probably even better and more challenging compared to the base game. It might be worth playing only for the gameplay if you don't mind the problems I mentioned. You can easily get 30 plus hours of gameplay from this single DLC. Then it all went downhill. The second DLC, Call of Tenabre, is one of the worst DLCs I ever played. I don't know how much you have to love the base game to put up with all the bullshit from this DLC. Call of Tenabre came out in 2017, 7 whole years after the game came out and 6 years after the first DLC. Once again, you can choose to import the save from the base game or just play it as a standalone experience with a high level character. First of all, the performance is a lot worse compared to the base game and the first DLC and even after I tweaked some graphical settings, I was struggling to get around 40 FPS, let alone 60. The story is about these red people who are supposed to be a brand new race, even though they look extremely similar to Varns from the base game. You get to see Darfa again and somehow she looks way worse compared to the base game. Okay. She has a new voice actress and I'm pretty sure the hero has a different voice actor, again. I'm not drunk. I'm... I'm trying to find a friend of mine. All of that aside, the game has some very annoying and downright stupid changes. For example, this huge visual effect which points you in the direction of the main quest, I guess. The newer DLC is even worse when it comes to this. But anyway, Call of Tenabre is just garbage and if you play this, I don't wanna be your friend. Amazingly, Reality Pump managed to outdone themselves with the latest DLC called Shattered Embrace. And believe it or not, it's a lot worse than even Call of Tenabre. I made a whole video a couple of years ago about this DLC and if you want a good laugh, I highly recommend watching it. Here are a couple of clips from that video. Well, looks friendly enough. Hold still. Maybe it'll go away. Wait, what's this? Press jump to move faster. Uh, what? Wow. I should have become an engineer. Yeah, whatever you do, don't buy this piece of shit, please. Even though I highly recommend playing the base game of Two Worlds 2, I don't really think you should give any of your money to this horrible company. But if you don't care about that and you're really interested in playing the game after this review, you might as well use my GOG link and support the channel. There is supposed to be a huge discount on GOG for the next couple of days because of the Halloween sale. Whatever you do, just don't bother with the DLCs unless you're a masochist or something. Like I said, maybe just the first DLC is worth playing if you really like the base game. Two Worlds 2 was always considered to be a mediocre RPG by the majority of people who played it and I guess that's the most accurate description of the game. Unfortunately, I don't believe we're ever going to see a third game in this series, but even if we do, God help us all. The best case scenario would be if someone buys this IP from Topper Interactive, THQ Nordic perhaps, I mean those guys are collecting IPs left and right. But anyway, thanks a lot for watching this review. You ever stop talking? If you like these kinds of videos, make sure to check out my previous reviews about RPGs. 
liking the video is highly appreciated and by subscribing you will get me closer and closer to that 100k milestone. If you want to go a step further and throw some coins at me, become a Patreon or a YouTube member. Even a dollar a month means a lot and you're going to get your name immortalized in the end credits. Many thanks to all of my current supporters and I'll see you in the next one.